Amen. I know uh, we uh, we gone through this week without seeing one another. And always a pleasure to see this because it's a picture of heaven, right there. Please stand with us as we sing our first song this morning. And our first song this morning is Agnew's Day. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and honor him. because you made us. We come because you put a song in our heart and you have bidden us on your errands this week. And so we come to thank you for your protection, 
for your joy that you have instilled in us, we come and we just ask that what we do today, what we sing, what we say, the conversations we have will be honoring to you, O oh God of the universe. May you be lifted up in our presence today. In Jesus' name. Children, after you receive the somewhat less than $5,000 in $1 bills today, uh, please come forward, ch children's story. Jesus loves the little ones like me. Morning, children. What is the best possible present you could give somebody at Christmas time? Does anybody have an idea? A Bible. A Bible. Any ideas? Anybody else? Yes, yes. Maybe a toy. Maybe a toy if they want. Okay. The best thing. One more person. What would you give if you could give them the very best thing? God. Okay. That would be a big package, wouldn't it? Soren? Love. Give them some love. No, nobody mentioned Legos or any such thing? All right. Um, I think the best thing you could give somebody, quite possibly, is yourself. Yourself would be the best gift ever. You could, for example, give yourself by washing dishes at home. Uh, you could carry things on your head and help somebody who can't carry things. You could give some clothes to somebody. Are you watching on the back screen there? Or you can turn around on the front screen. You could help somebody uh, down the street who can't otherwise walk. You could help cook in the kitchen. What a mess, but you could help. And there are people all over the world this very morning who don't have homes, riding they don't know where on boats, not knowing where to put their head, not knowing where their next meal may come from, not knowing where they may sleep. And so they have to sleep sometimes on a rock. Now this girl is named Hannah Taylor. She's age eight in this picture. She saw a man eating garbage one day and felt very sorry that somebody had to eat garbage. That was age five, and she started what's called the Ladybug Foundation. That's an organization that helps people. And she raised spare change from businesses of over $2 million. 
Now, I know some of you have been involved at Silver State Adventist School or otherwise in your schools. You've helped raise a lot of money, too, for charitable purposes. <coughs> this person is Craig Kielberger. It shows him at age 12. And he read about a Pakistani boy who had been sold as a slave at age four. He helped free the boy at age 10. Unfortunately, the boy died shortly thereafter. But with some other seventh graders, Craig started Free the Children Foundation, and they've helped thousands of kids get out of very difficult situations. This is Alexandra Scott, not a very good picture. Uh, and this is age eight. At age four, she developed cancer. She started the Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, and even though she has died, her foundation goes on raising lots and lots of money for all kinds of good purposes. This is Janine LeCare and Aislin Livingston at age nine. They have started an organization called Save the Rainforest, as you can read there, helping save the rainforest. To date, because of their efforts in raising money, the Tishi monkey population in Central America has been increased from about 1,000 to 4,000. And this last person is Austin Gutwin. He started the Hoops for Hope Foundation. He read about children in Africa who were losing their parents to disease. And so he started this foundation to help them. And it's called Hoops for Hope because on one day, he shot 2,057 free throws, free throws, that's baskets in basketball, and he raised $3,000. Since then, his foundation has gone on to raise $3 million for kids to give them clothing, places to live, and all kinds of help. So it shows what kids your age or not very much older can do to make yourself the best gift of all at Christmas time or all around the year. Now we're going to demonstrate what, what a beautiful gift some of you could make. And while we're demonstrating what a great gift a couple of you could make, I'm going to give you a picture of Jesus who's the best gift ever, who gave himself for all of us for all time. We, we have two fantastic gifts here to themselves and to all of us this morning. Uh, what do you think of these gifts this morning? All right. Thank you. Thank you, children. You can go ahead. Back to your seats. Good morning, family. Good morning, family. Good morning. Thank you. That's much better. First of all, we'd like to 
invite and welcome our visitors today, and we are delighted you're here. Worthy is the Lamb. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Um, visitors, please join us for a meal prepared for you in the Stone House after worship service, and we'll have a nice meal, and we'll converse, and uh, we'll praise God for all this snow. This is wonderful. Just if, yes, you are, because we hardly ever see you. <laughs> this poor guy travels way too much. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, Yeyu has an announcement here in a moment, but he's right behind me, and Brandon's going to be on his way up too. Uh, um, if you're interested in what your church is doing, you want to read this here. It's called a bulletin, and it gives you information on uh, events and ministries that this church does. Uh, I would want to uh, direct your attention to one. Actually, Brandon is going to talk about this. No, go ahead. You're more prepared for this. Okay. Um, first of all, you all should have received something that looks like this. This is a loving reminder that next week we are going to be doing our presents for parents. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be bringing age-appropriate presents for children. And we're going to be giving those to our community center. And one of the wonderful things about us having a community center is that we have people such as Yeu who... Um, are really connected with some of the lower income areas. And so they know exactly who it is that needs extra help. And so for those people, for parents who are unable to get their kids gifts this year because um, they're living on such a tight budget, they're barely feeding them, um, we're going to bring these to them so that they can provide a Christmas for their family as well. So next week, take this home, let it remind you that you need to go Bring a uh, age-appropriate gift for children this next week, and then we're going to be having a little ceremony that goes along with that. There is one other thing that I want to talk about that isn't in your bulletin, but also very, very, very important. You have heard me go on and on about the uh, the mission trip that we're going to be doing coming up. And for those of you who are interested, we're going to be having our first informational meeting coming up Ready? Write it down. This Friday at 6 p.m., this coming Friday at 6 p.m. in the Stone House. If you cannot make it, that's okay. We will have handouts later so that you can come up and I'll give that information to you. But if you are interested, then I highly suggest that you try to make it to this meeting. We will be going over all the information you need to know um, about how to make it work, how much it'll cost, the uh, fundraisers that we're going to be doing, the details such as passports that you're going to be getting, the shots, the, we'll be answering all your questions as well then. So please mark that down. This coming Friday at 6 p.m. in the Stone House. Thank you. How many of you love Carolyn? <laughs> Raise your hands. Amen. For those of you that don't know, I'm down at the Center of uh, Influence, and myself and uh, my two bosses, Jerry and James. James, where are you, James? Is he here? No? James not here. Well, Dory's back there. Well, we're going to be having a, um, holding a, a Christmas caroling on Tuesday at about 6.30. Um, it's for that whole community there. We're going to be providing refreshments, um, hot apple cider and cocoa. And we want you all to come out. And our own Riverview Praise Team is going to be leading out. So I'm hoping that we get a good turnout, especially for that community there. So I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our uh, worship includes offering. And um, we're going to have a short video to open up our appeal for offering.
Psalm 9, 18 reminds us God's abounding love for vulnerable in our communities. God will never forget the needy. The hope of the afflicted will never perish. Christian love motivates us to serve those in need in our communities. Rich and poor alike struggle with the situations from which they cry out for help. People may be prisoners of addictions, limited by health issues, and suffering from economic challenges, language barriers, and education. The list goes on. Each barrier prevents them from reaching the full potential that God designed for them as His children. Through the world budget today, your offering will support Adventist Community Services, ACS, in the North American Division. By supporting ACS ministry, you can make a lasting impact in your community and beyond. Whether it's volunteering your time, donating goods, or making financial contributions, when we touch one heart, one family, one community, together we are helping to transform the lives of people. Jesus lived his life as a humble servant. Matthew 20, 28 says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Therefore, the bottom line of the Christian journey is to be a servant of God. Adventist Community Services provides you with opportunities to be a servant of God in your own community. They lend their support and assistance in disaster response ministries, elder care, crisis care, urban ministries, tutoring and mentoring, hope for humanity, and youth and young adults empowered to serve. Your financial gifts to the Adventist Community Services offering will make it possible to continue transforming communities one life at a time. Adventist Community Services. Would the deacons please come forward to receive our offerings? Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we take a few minutes here to contemplate the great needs all around us. We've just heard of an arm of our church that reaches out to those in need, and we've been asked to contribute to that need, Father. So we uh, come today thanking you and praising you, O oh God, that you have given us much while Christ had little. Let us keep this in context, Father. So we offer today from our means that you have given us, and thank you, and praise you, and honor you today with our offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. We got a big community thing coming up tomorrow. I'm going to invite Pastor Tui and the choir up, and he's going to explain a little bit more what's going on tomorrow. This is time for the choir. Praise the Lord. Tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, our Tongan community in the faith uh, caroling night here, and we are hosting it, and uh, uh, we just want to bring in one item so you can see, feel the flavor of what we're going to share with our uh, community. As you all know, we Polynesian people, uh, our singing is more likely is our worshiping. And uh, part of the song we're going to sing, the chorus uh, says, Sing hallelujah, let us sing. Oh, friends and family, let us all sing together for the good news that God has loved us. Amen.
and we're going to sing in tongue.
want to thank our Tommy committee for the special number. How many of you enjoyed that? Say amen. Amen. And our first song is better as one day. Yeah. start off this song and then the guys will join in and then second verse the guys will lead out.
Amen. I'm going to have the group come forward. This is our prayer song this morning. And as my prayer this morning, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with heavy hearts. Mm. We just learned that Marcy Hummel has lost a daughter, and we hurt for her, Lord. And we lift up her, Rob, and Peyton, the child. Pray for the comfort, O oh God, that only you can give. Amen. This heartache that we suffer, O Lord, is only a part of what this world suffers. Yes. The pain and the agony and the deceit and the wickedness of this world, O oh Lord. You have brought us here. For comfort, but also you've asked us to go out and to minister, to serve as your hands and your feet in this community. We thank you, Father in heaven, that behind that request for us, that command for us to go out, is your word to strengthen us and your Holy Spirit to empower us. We thank you for that. Forgive us, O Lord, for not, for not exercising that, those gifts. And we acknowledge, Lord, we're weak and helpless. But we turn to you this morning, O Lord, in praise to honor you, to thank you, and to offer ourselves to you once again. We pray for, Pastor, this morning that your word will find its way into our hearts. Help us, Lord. It's difficult to give up. It's, it's difficult, Lord, to give up everything. Help us. Because we know deep down that what you offer us is far greater than what this world offers us. So we 
commit ourselves to you once again, our God and our Father, and thank you that you have made a covenant with us and it's caused the blood of your dear son Jesus to confirm and ratify it. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to internalize that, to look at it and to realize that it's not our power. It's your power, O oh God, that accomplishes things. We just need to be faithful and obedient and trust you and to follow. follow. So we commit ourselves to you once again, O oh Lord, in praise and thank you for that wonderful Savior who longs to be in our life every day. And we pray in his precious, wonderful, and powerful name. Amen. Jesus, amen. him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took him, took charge of, him, of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Arabic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side of, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a, note, had a notice prepared and listened to the and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign. For the people, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The, chiefs, the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven, in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not, tear, let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened with that, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From, the, from that time on, this, the, this disciple took her into his home. A long time ago, humankind believed that God would send another flood. They did not believe the promise of the rainbow, and so they built a tower in a place 
called Babel. God decided that this was not part of his plan. And he took things in hand and went down and confused their languages. And so it was that an American was working on the third floor and a Tongan was working on the fifth floor and asked for some more cement. Only the American didn't know what he was saying. And so the Tongans went to live in Tonga. And some crazy people like the Italians and the Irish and... Oh, don't forget the Vikings. I didn't know that Iowa had so many Danish monuments. When I drove across the United States this summer, I went through Iowa and there were more signs saying, go to this Danish monument or go to... The Danes own Iowa. Did you know that? So when you hear in a year or so about the Iowa caucuses, it's the Danes coming out to vote. Here we live, here we live in this world today, but I believe that this morning we have already been transported to the courts above, yes? Here we, we celebrate the fact that long ago in a stable far away, Jesus was born. And yet he was destined to be where he is today, which is in the courts above, in the heavenly sanctuary in heaven next to his father. We worship today. We worship. We come together. We congregate together to worship. And we worship the king of Israel. We worship the king of the universe. We worship as magi. I don't know. Are you a learned person? Have you spent more than 12 years under the tutelage of a teacher? Some of us have spent twice that much. Maybe we could consider ourselves magi. But we also come today and worship as shepherds. Shepherds who knew what it was to see a sunset and know what was coming tomorrow. Shepherds who knew what it was to be thought of as the lesser of society. We come today as magi and shepherds. And you know what? He has promised us in Scripture that he inhabits, he inhabits our praise. He likes it, like that old life commercial of long ago that took my name in vain. Mikey, he likes it. He is the Michael, the leader of the almighty hosts of heaven, and he likes it. He loves it when we come together and when we praise him in spirit and in truth. He Loves it. I didn't know I was going to say that earlier this week. But that's what that song did to me. Thank you, Tongans, for being the strength that God has created you to be and for singing his praises. Turn in your Bibles if you have them, and if you keep your electronics close to you, I promise you I will not condemn you for looking at Facebook or any other things while we do this because I will be consulting my own electronic device for some input that I received from a friend this morning, but that's later. Turn in your Bibles. Go to that app that says Bible, and if you don't have an app on your phone that says Bible, shame on you. You version has made it possible for all of us to carry God's word on our phone. If you have music that is talking about all the beautiful things of this world, but you have not the Bible, your phone is not up to date. 
If you have pictures that tell you all about your family and all about what's going on with the Kardashians, but have not the Bible, your phone is not up to date. Put the Bible on your phone, refer to it, read it, let it change your life because, my friends, it is the Word of God. Turn in the Word of God to John chapter 19 and verse 16. This is where we begin to look at the Scripture today. Only the story begins much earlier because that is the season that we find ourselves in. It begins in a manger in Beit Lechem. Beth Lechem, the house of bread. Bethlehem is the house of bread, and, it, and, it, and if you stick with me really closely right now, you're going to see that what Jesus lays down in his plan and how he executes his plan is so beautifully woven together that some have called it a tapestry of heaven. He is, he claims, to be the bread of life. Yes? John tells us that as well. He is the bread of life and he says, I am the same bread that kept the Israelites going for 40 years in the desert. They didn't know what it was. And just like that, they didn't know who he was when he came from heaven. And so they called it manna, which in Hebrew means, what is it? They still use the word today. If you want to use that word, you can. You just look at that thing that has been prepared by your wife and you say, mana. And she says, no, we're not having mana today. What is it? I mean, can you imagine calling the food that sustains you, that gives you life, that keeps you going in the desert for 40 years, you call it, what is it? Sounds like the who's on first joke. They just called it, what is it? And they did the same thing to Jesus when he landed in uh, the, the stable that night with his parents. It was the only place where they could house him. But yet he is being housed, he is being housed in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And he is the bread of life. It makes all kinds of sense. And so we also know that they, they call him Emmanuel which being interpreted means God with us. The angels come and they sing glory to God. So we know that he is being announced appropriately as the king of the universe, as their commander in chief. The shepherds are there, the, the people who are considered basic humanity. If you want to go to the everyday man, if you, if you want to send your message to the person who, who is you know, cleaning the streets or the person who picks up your garbage or the person who, you know, that you don't think necessarily has to be educated, but uh, let me tell you, uh, sanitary engineer, yes, that's the word, Sanitary engineer, thank you very much, is the person who works for waste management and makes sure that your garbage doesn't collect too much at your house. It was to the common man that Jesus revealed himself and the angels said, go and see him. I want you to also note that John chapter 19 is around Passover. So not only do you have this picture of Jesus in the manger, by the way, you, you know that French word, right? Anyone else speak French? Anyone speak Italian? Speak Italiano. What does the grandmother always say when she puts the pasta before you? Mange, mange. Eat, eat. Jesus is born in a mange. He's born in a manger. He's born in a, a trough that was to be filled with food for animals. He is the food for the world. He is the bread of life. 
So keep that picture and realize that another meal takes place when the Israelites are ready to leave Egypt. And he becomes the lamb, the last meal that is roasted. Don't get too hungry on me here. I know it's getting late. But they stand up. They don't sit down. They stand up. They're ready to go. They're ready to pass over from slavery into freedom. But before they can pass over, the death angel passes over. The death angel passes over, and as he passes over, he looks for the blood. So you know where this is going. So you know where this story is going and you know that the Passover plays a part in it. It plays the part that indicates that it will take the exchange of blood, life, in order to satisfy the situation. Keep that picture in mind. Keep in mind in John chapter 18 verse 28 another picture. It is the trial. Jesus has now been captured and he is being brought before the high priests. They cannot find anything wrong with him. He answers in a way that causes one of the guards to slap him. And he tells the guard, why did you hit me? What I said was true. I have taught in your presence. I have done nothing in secret. I have told no lies. So when they couldn't find anything wrong with him, they sent him to Pilate. And because it was Passover coming up, they refused to go in to see Pilate because it would make them unclean, but yet they wanted to arraign the king of heaven. I don't want us to miss the irony of this situation because we as sinful human beings, as those who even this week, I mean, do you feel it? Those who even this week have made decisions that have taken us away from Jesus. Either consciously or unconsciously, we have joined that group of people that need salvation. We need saving. We need to have our hearts cleansed. It's one of the reasons I come to church. Because I want to be together with a group of people who know that they need Jesus. And who, who want to sing praises to him and want to ask for his forgiveness. And at the very moment that these religious leaders are practicing their religion, they will not go in to see Pilate in his house because it will make them unclean. Their religion is more important than their relationship. Do you see that? If you don't catch the irony of that, the pain of that that must have hurt the Father, his people, Loving the form, but denying the power thereof. It's not just them, folks. It's us. It's us. So they take him out to crucify him. The king of the Jews... We sing at this time of year, once, once in royal David city. Yes, yes, by descent, Jesus was a descendant of David. He was the one who would come and sit on David's throne and of his kingdom, the Bible says, there would be no end. Yes, Jesus was that one. Yes, he was the king. But they wanted to crucify him. So they took him. They took him to Pilate, as I was saying. And I want you to, I want you to grab a hold of this too because it, it, it's the big picture. 
Pilate represents Rome. Rome represents world government. Rome represents world power. And it represents that which is infused by the dark side. And face to face with him is Emmanuel. The one that we, that we sing about, the one that we celebrate, God with us. And so this, this potentate, this, this pilot, asks a question for all of us. He asks the question that the dark side wants to know the answer to. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers back in verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. And then in verse 37b, he says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So if, if you want to know what truth is, if, if that, it, because that, my friend, is, is the next question that Pilate asks, what is truth? If you want to know what truth is, I'm going to, I'm going to put something forward to you and say that truth is a person. Truth is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. Truth was born in Bethlehem as a baby in a manger. Truth grew up and had a ministry. He was the son of God at that moment and 100% human as well. And the king of the universe come down to reclaim his rightful place as king of this world, which, praise God, he is right now. So truth seekers, if you are a truth seeker today, if you are looking for the answers to your questions, if you're looking for ultimate truth, which many say cannot be found in the Bible, which many say cannot be found in Christianity, I say to you today, it's just not true. Because he is truth. He is. So, a confused pilot asks the leaders, he says, you know, every year about this time, I, I let one of your, your rebels go. Somebody who has been trying to take away from Rome. A thief. Somebody who wants us to leave. So will it be this guy? Because if he's claiming to be king of the Jews, that makes him a thief from Rome. In Rome's eyes, he's nothing but a common thief. Or do you want me to release you Barabbas? Another rebel. A zealot who wants to steal from Rome. They choose Barabbas. They choose Barabbas. Pilate doesn't know what to do. Pilate doesn't know what to do, and so he hands Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. He hands him over to the dark side. What do they do? My friends, they pound his face into a pulp. The irony of that, the, the pain of that, and the fact that this is the face of God, and evil is taking its fists and pounding it into mush. And then they say, oh, you think you're the king? We'll give you king. And they take a crown of thorns and they push it down into his skull till the blood flows along with what was coming out of his eyes, his nose, his ears. And they throw a purple robe over him saying, you want to be king of this place? Come on, give it your best shot. This is the dark side pounding on the king of the universe.
So finally, when he is led out, he goes up that hill. He's being flogged too. Some of you have seen the movie. Thirteen minutes devoted in a major feature film to the whipping of Jesus. I don't know how he could take that cross. I don't know how. Because my friends, that, that cross was you and me. That's what my friend texted me this morning. Ellen, Ellen White says when he talks about taking up your cross, it's his cross. He is hoping today, my friends, at this time, and, and Jim, thank you so much for all the opportunities, and we saw also the giving opportunity that comes through Adventist Community Services. This is a giving season, my friends. But what Jesus was carrying in that cross was us. He was carrying us. He came here because of us. And he is looking for people who will do the same thing, who will have compassion and will have appreciation for other human beings. Just like he had appreciation and care and love. That's what he's looking for. It is amazing to me that, that the soldiers grabbed a hold of, of that guy. What was his name? Simon. Yes. Grabbed a hold of Simon and said, you carry his cross. Jesus couldn't anymore. And so he's, he's, he's up on the cross. And, and, and there are people, there are people around. There are people. Some of them actually are his people. There are also people around who I believe are representing the dark side and they're yelling things at him like, you don't really need to die up there, you know. <laughs> you, you saved others. You can come down too. Do you think those were their words? No. Those were the words of the evil one who was taunting him to leave us behind. You carried that cross far enough. You're up on that cross, but you don't need to stay. They're not worth it. You don't really love them that much, do you? Come on down. You just, you know, call 10,000 angels and get out of here. That was the dark side. Tempting Jesus to leave us behind. But it was a long way. It was 33 and a half years of agony since that time when he was brought into the world by Mary. You know his... His daddy wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Raise your hand if you know what those were supposed to be for. Well, good. They were grave clothes, people. Joseph's grave clothes. That's what he wrapped his baby in. Where was that? Manger, did you say? Out back. Well, you go to Bethlehem today, and you know what's out back behind the houses? Caves. That, 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 that stable that he was born in was a cave. Are you, are you getting the same feeling that I'm getting? That what happened in the beginning, just like a good book, my friends, just like an amazing story, this thing that happens at the beginning is happening at the end. It's just the same. He ends up being wrapped in grave clothes and put in a cave. Yes, it was a man-made cave. 
Who knows that the one in Bethlehem wasn't too? It's soft limestone. And the people probably hewed out places to put their animals, put a, a, a barrier in the front, and that's where the animals stayed. And that's where Jesus was born. And finally, he gets put in another cave. Born to die. His dad's grave clothes are his first clothes. So let's look. Who bothered to stay by? As I, I entitled our time together today, Appointed to the Cross or Disappointed by the Cross. Who stayed? Who took up the appointment at the foot of the cross? Or as Matthew tells us, we're watching from a distance. This is John 19, verse 25. Look carefully because it's a very interesting list of women. Gentlemen, the chips are down. Are you going to be part of the appointed or are you going to be part of the disappointed? This is the picture right here. He's got his mom. Her name is Mary. Then he's got his mom's sister. This is John chapter 19, verse 25. We know that Mary Magdalene from, from Magdala was there. Very close friend of Jesus whom Ellen tells us that he had cast demons out of at least seven times. It's going to be very important that you recognize that in a moment. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved was also there. This is John, remember, and he does not name himself in his own gospel. He uses euphemistic phrases like this one. The John, John says the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then there's a fifth person that we see there in John, Mary, the wife of Clopas. Now, scholars are uh, always looking for new and exciting things. And I am very excited to tell you that Matthew has a different list. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 56. So hold your hand in John and move over to Matthew or scroll, whatever you need to do. You have Mary Magdalene there. You have Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. And you have the mom of Zebedee's sons, meaning Zebedee's wife. We know from other texts that she potentially was named Salome. If it is indeed Salome that is at the cross, then that would make her Jesus' aunt and that James and John were his cousins. Okay? It's very interesting to look at that. But what I'm interested most this morning, my friends, is who kept the appointment? Who stayed? Because there's also a list of those who didn't. Where was Peter? We know where Judas was. Pretty gory story. Probably make the front page news, you know. Disenchanted Christian leaves church, commits suicide out back. Anyone else like that these days? Anyone, anyone leaving because they are disappointed? Because Jesus, Jesus didn't live up to their expectations. Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to do. Jesus didn't give them what they wanted to have. Because you see, it was all about them. It's all about them. And because he didn't come through with what they wanted, they left. Hey, you, you look like the one of the guys that was in the garden with Jesus. Oh, no, I'm not. Curse, 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 curse. Peter. And just after that, cock a doodle doo. And Peter remembers what Jesus says. Before the cock crows, you will tell somebody 
that you don't know me. Three times. Peter, Peter is disappointed. Peter is disappointed with Jesus. So much so that he denies his association with him in public to people who were obviously not happy with Jesus as well. He denies his association three times in a small matter of time. Folks, before we get down on him, how many times did we do that this week? Me, I can tell you. How many times did we have the chance? Did we have the chance to say, yes! I'm with him. He's my Lord, my Savior. I love him. But instead we went, no, uh, don't know him. Disappointed. Where's, where's, where's James? I mean, we're talking about the three closest friends of Jesus. Peter, James, John. Where are his closest friends, his his buddies, the ones, the ones he went up on that mountain with and, and was transfigured and looked like the glorious Lord that we are looking forward to seeing as Adventists someday with Moses on one side and, and Elijah on the other. He shared that with them and they still didn't want to be with him. Ouch. Ouch. Where did, where did they all go? Well, on the third day, this is the best part of the story. <laughs> on the third day, Jesus did resurrect. Jesus came out of the grave, and he is the king of the world today. And who was there to greet him? Well, it happened to be that lady named Mary. Now, two of the ladies had gone to put spices on him, as was their custom, because they had had hurriedly had to wrap him up in grave clothes and put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and they hadn't had time to put the special spices on him so his body, as it decayed, wouldn't stink too bad. And so they went early on Sunday morning to do that because the Sabbath is now over. And so they, they are going, and they find that the tomb is empty. They come back, and... They are not believed. Gentlemen, please. We live in a day and an age now where we hope we can start believing the women. I mean, for Pete's sake, we're Seventh-day Adventists and we have a prophetess. Come on now. Come on now. This, this story is, is, is full of women staying and men leaving. Guess what? It's still a problem in the church. It's still a problem. Men, we need to stand up and claim our proper place in the church. Okay? We need to be counted on. We need people who know Jesus to be here because there are so many who are not. And our children need to know that there are men who love Jesus and will stay around. They're back in the room and... The ladies are not being believed, but Peter and John, they light out and they go to the tomb. And, and John's quicker, but he's scared. He's younger. So he waits by the side of the tomb. He looks in. He sees Jesus is not there. And then Peter comes in. We know about Peter. He's had a terrible experience in the last 24 hours. He wants to know, is it true? Is it really true? Is he gone? Did they steal him away? What is going on? I have to know. And he barges right in. But then they leave. They leave again. Who sticks around? Yep. She's the one who took perfume that was worth a whole year's wage. Are you hearing me? What, what was her work again? Where did she get that money? Uh-huh. You're guessing it. But she took that money from the trade that is as old as, as, as infidelity. 
And she took that money and she, she rededicated it in, in, in rededicating her whole life. And she bought perfume. She bought the equivalent of, of Chanel number no. five, the big one. And she uncorked that baby and she poured all of it on Jesus' feet in front of her pimp. Simon who'd got leprosy and had been healed by Jesus and had forgotten to invite his little friend Mary to the party. So there's Jesus who had not been offered the usual courtesies of washing the feet, who had not been offered the kiss that is customary when someone comes into your house, had not been offered any of these common courtesies. And then when she uncorks this perfume and pours it, has the audacity to lean over to someone leaning next to him and say, if he knew what kind of woman she is, he would not let her Touch him. Oh, yeah. Simon knew all about her skills. Uh huh. He's having a vision at that moment and he's thinking evil, dirty thoughts about Jesus. And guess what? Jesus knows. <laughs> Please, uh, kids, this is going to haunt you forever, so listen carefully. Jesus knows what you're doing. Jesus sees what you are doing. There is no place, the Bible says, there is no place on this planet where you can hide from God. Now we say amen, but next time you're thinking, oh, wow, if Jesus was here, <laughs> this would really be bad. Just know that that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. And he's saying, you know what, I love you. I, I don't need you to be doing this because it hurts me. It hurts. Yep, it's that lady. It's, it's that lady that sticks around. She is appointed. She is appointed to the cross and she keeps her appointment. She keeps it right through to the place where she is in the garden and she is, she is looking in. She's been in the tomb. She's seen and the angels are there and, 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 and she said to them, can you, can you please tell me where they've taken my Jesus? And then she hears a very, very familiar voice. Familiar because she had spent time in his presence. Familiar because she had ministered to him as one of probably the 120 that followed him all throughout his ministry. And yet she had had times when she'd fallen back. And then she'd had times when she'd been healed by him. And she knew his voice. And he just had to say, Mary. She, he called her name. And through her tears, she knew, she knew who he was. Because she had been looking for him. She had been keeping her appointment with him. And she lunges for him. <laughs> she can't wait to be physically connected to him. And he has to say, wait, 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 wait. I have not been to my father yet. But I'm going. I'm going to come back. Just wait. Now, go tell, what, the other women? No, they'd already been to the tomb. Go tell your brothers that I'm alive. So where were they? Where were they? they my friends, they were in a locked room. <laughs> That's where they were. She goes back. She knocks on the door. She gives the special secret knock, and they let her in, and, and she says, he's alive. He's alive. She is the very first witness, my friend. She is the very first witness to the risen Lord. It's Mary. Not his mother. Mary the whore. Mary the prostitute. Mary the, the, the Satan worshiper. I, I don't know about you. But this is evidence to me 
that there is no one, there is no one that Jesus isn't interested in. There is no one that Jesus doesn't have value for. And the crazy thing is, he is calling us to put his cross, to put his values, to put his compassion, to put his love onto our backs and to bear that cross. To value people like he valued people. Yes, that young man that, that you saw there who is trying to free uh, slaved children. You, you can't tell me that doesn't haunt you at night. Millions of people in slavery in our world today, more so than in the Roman times, more so than any other time in history. Can you, can, can you be a follower? Can you bear that cross and not feel that pain? Can you be a Christian? Can you be an Adventist looking forward to the second coming of this man who came and went to the cross for you? Can you be that person and not feel that pain? I don't know about you, but it just breaks me up. Do you think it doesn't exist in Reno? Maybe you think it just exists in California. Oh, those wicked Californians. Well, I have news for you. Uh, we got joined up. Truckee is now part of our district. So our district has California in it. There's nobody, there's nobody, there's nobody that this man will not go to the cross for. He will. He will take them on his back. He will go, he will let them punch him in the face, put a crown of thorns, beat his back until it is ribbons, and then carry that person to the cross in front of the entire universe. Question is, Will you, will I, take up the cross of Emmanuel, God with us? Will it last? Will this giving season last longer than just Advent? Really? Or will it? Will, will we let it, will we let it change our lives, change who we are in our essence so that when we look at people, we see them how Jesus saw them? Because that's what he came to do. That's what he hopes will happen in each of our lives is that we will become connected to the Father and that his mind will become that which controls our mind and that we will allow the Holy Spirit to possess us so that when we look at someone and we see a situation, we, we are not going to be asking, how does this benefit me? We're going to be asking, how, God, do you want me to benefit this person? Because you have brought me into existence. You have given me life because you are calling me to be your hands and feet to the world, to those who don't know. God bless them. There are so many people who are in pain right now. They're lonely. It's the biggest disease of those over 50. It's why people commit suicide more than anything else. And guess what? They do it at Christmas time. Because they're lonely. Do we care? Does Jesus care? Does Jesus see them? 
Would he potentially be tapping one of us, two of us, ten of us, all of us on the shoulder and saying, you know what, I've got a job for you. There's somebody who's really lonely and I need you to go see them. I need you to tell them that I love them. I need you to tell them that I'm always going to be there for them. I need you to tell them that they are welcome in your life. Because by going to the cross, my friends, Jesus invited us into his life. He said, I'll take your death so that you can have my life. I have an eternal life. I'll give that to you so that I, if I and I'll take, I'll take the death for you. That, that's what he did. Okay? <laughs> It, it amazes me, it amazes me that at this time of year that, that, that this is when we feel this, but that at other times of the year we, we don't feel this so much. So I'm asking that today you decide with me that we are going to rededicate ourselves to being Christ followers, to being those who are infused by the Holy Spirit, and that the giving that you feel now, the opportunities that are a, a, a mass array, and, and again, that was, that was a great opportunity. Do you, do you see what those kids were doing that, that Jim showed us today? Kids who decided, I can't live in a world where that kid is in, 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 in some kind of jail. I can't live in a world where people are dying because they don't have clean water. I can't live in a world where people are going to bed hungry at night. That's what Jesus is saying. You know, a bunch of disappointed guys got together and went fishing on Lake Galilee yeah, Jesus had said, go up to Galilee and I'll meet you there. But you know what they were thinking about? They were thinking about how Jesus had not done what they wanted him to do. They weren't thinking about Jesus very much. In fact, they didn't want to think about Jesus. He had disappointed them. And so it was that they didn't recognize him on the beach. He was broiling some fish. It was Peter, though, to his credit. It was Peter who saw Jesus when they got closer. And you know what? I, I love his imp impetuous, can-do, let's-get-it-done-now attitude. And that was uh, the, in the King James. I like the King James in this. He girded up his loins. He strips off his coat, holds it above his head, and jumps in knowing he's going to get wet. And he swims and then wades to shore and he falls at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus loves him. Jesus accepts him. Jesus doesn't say, dude, <laughs> what about that courtyard? You're gonna, you've got some major sucking up to do. No. He says, feed my sheep. So I've got good news for you this morning. If you feel like you've been Peter this week, if you feel like you have denied your association by how you've spoken to someone or how you've you know, not loved your wife or not loved your husband or your significant other, there's hope. You can try again. You can, you can give it to Jesus. You can come to Jesus and he's going to say, you know what, I can make it all right. I can make it all right. I love you but I want you to go out and feed my sheep. I, I, I love you a lot, man. More than a brother. I love you with a godly love that knows no end. But now I want you to take that love to the world. I want you to take it into your world and I want you to love other people. If that's what you want to do, just raise your hand. Just say, I'm going to go love people for Jesus this week. There's so many that need it. Amen. And amen. Let's sing about this. I'm going to invite the choir back up. They are going to sing with us. Please, please know that he inhabits our praise. So sing like you know he likes it. Those of you that are comfortable with your hymn, hymn number is 123. 
but we don't leave your presence. We are thankful that we have been here. We, we hear your voice again, and we just ask that we would continue to hear it, that it would sing sweet songs to us this week, and that we would sing back, and that the joyful reunion that we have together on a daily basis would lead others to want to be with you too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.